This is the Emergency Medical Minute, sponsored by Health One. Okay, good morning. I'm not a mirage. I am your 7 a.m. doctor for the first time in over a year. Yep. And for the last time for the foreseeable future, but it will be, it'll be a great day. So um, I had a good friend who I worked with in D.C., Manish Goyle, who used to say there's two things we should do better in emergency medicine than anybody else in any other specialty. Any ideas? I always thought this was funny answers. You can say anything. Venereal disease. No. Um, resuscitation and risk stratification. We should really be better at that than anybody. We, we get patients who are coming in sick, right? We need to be able to resuscitate them, and we need to be able to figure out what part of the hospital is the most appropriate place for them. Uh, and obviously, you know, if you've worked at different places, people, you know, their step-down units versus the floor versus the unit. And we have the PCU, but it's kind of, we oftentimes are making this call between effectively the floor and the ICU. And what sort of factors can we look at that predict whether or not a patient is at risk for decompensating once they're being admitted to the floor, right? Because we're all in it together. And what I'll tell you is that nothing has ever been proven to be better than good communication between both doc to doc and nurse to nurse about where, how the patient looked when they came in, how they look now, and any risks that they might have to decompensate. So between good communication and frequent vital sign checks, nothing is better than that, period. And there's no magic formula. But there are some things that we can look at. Uh, notably, the two most common conditions that get admitted that then crump on the floor are either sepsis or something that's respiratory related, right? So that's obviously a big bucket, but they can be COPD or CHF. Those are the two, two of the most prominent ones. And obviously pneumonia crosses both of those. So any of those admitting diagnoses are particularly high risk. And if anyone comes into the department and uh, needs non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, okay, or if they have a pre-existing history of CHF or new acute hypoxic respiratory failure, those patients, we should be convincing ourselves that we've, one, resuscitated them enough, and two, that they don't need a higher level of care, okay? Uh, ways that we can do that, you'll see different docs do it different ways, but there's good utility in using serial blood gases, both VBGs and ABGs for respiratory conditions, depending on what the underlying physiology is and whether or not you seem to be making progress on those gases with your interventions, okay? You'll hear us, you'll see us do BiPAP trials, you'll see us do diuretic trials based on, if, if it's CHF related. So you'll see different strategies, but there's typically a role for serial blood draws and trajectory not just of blood, but also of vitals and respiratory support and that sort of thing as a way to prevent as much as possible decompensation. The other, uh, you know, and then in sepsis, obviously you see it, we get a lot, our bundles include a lot of repeat lactates. The goal per ASEP, American College of Emergency Physicians, is that you should have a 10% reduction in your lactate. It's not exactly data-driven, but it's a good, good start that at least it's not rising in addition to vital signs and other things. And then finally, what about the patients themselves put them at risk for decompensating? Well, it's, it's largely intuitive. The patients who come in with pre-existing comorbidities are the ones who are more likely to crump once you admit them to the floor. Okay, and there's a variety of scoring systems that you can use for that. One of them is Apache 2, used in the unit a lot. It's used to you know, predict mortality in the unit. A variety of different factors. But the point is you're looking for that hidden multi-system organ failure, right? So the organ failure is easy to find when it's respiratory failure or uh, mental status changes. You know, the, we, we catch those, but there's occult multi-system organ failure, whether it's coagulopathy or acute kidney injury or an elevated billy or LFTs that tell us that that, that too is also evidence of early system failure uh, that we may not otherwise diagnose. And so a lot of those variables go into these scoring systems and different docs will use them in different ways, but just be on the lookout for occult metabolic derangement or organ failure in patients with pre-existing comorbidities, particularly if they're sepsis or respiratory related. And those are the patients that we just have to convince ourselves that we've resuscitated them enough they're going to the floor. Okay? Questions? Comments? Thoughts? Because most of the studies for this data, are, they look at patients that were admitted who had a rapid call on them within the first 12 or 24 hours of being admitted. And not all of them are preventable. Sometimes it happens, but we want to try and minimize as much as possible. 
Hello, Emergency Medical Minute listeners. This is Nancy Lorenzon, Faculty in Biological Sciences at the University of Denver and Pre-Health Advisor for the University. I want to tell you about an awesome event that we're hosting later this month. On November 21st to the 24th, clinicians, educators, policymakers, and community will gather at the University of Denver for the first Colorado Behavioral Health and Wellness Summit. The intersection of mental health and substance use continues to be a challenge in the state of Colorado, as you know. The University of Denver, the Mental Health Center of Denver, and Envision You join forces to create the summit as we share a collective commitment to encourage neighbors, friends, family, and colleagues from all around Colorado to learn more about behavioral health issues and substance use disorder. At this summit, speakers and presenters will engage our community to break down silos statewide and to bridge gaps in communication and collaboration. The summit will provide various audiences with approaches to awareness and education, training and clinical practice, and policy advocacy in action. Participants are able to discover new tools and resources, discuss practical strategies for change, and connect with colleagues and experts. We hope this community collaboration will foster an increased focus on tackling these difficult issues. The event is free and open to the public, and we hope you all join. For more information, please visit our website at portfolio.du.edu slash co health and wellness summit, or you can contact me at nancy.lorenzon at du.edu.